Hello and welcome to another episode of Initial Impressions. It's been a while since I've been able to do one of these and put one of these out, and I apologize for that. It's just school's just started up again. I have a lot of classes. I'm going to and from the campus seven times a week, which takes a lot out of me. I haven't had time to just sit down and watch an anime for a while, but thankfully I'm starting to catch up on the shows that I had started, so I should have a few initial impressions coming out over the next few weeks. Uh, this time it is the Tower of Draga. Draga! or however you pronounce it, the Aegis of, or the Aegis, whichever you prefer, I'm pretty sure it's Aegis, the Aegis of Uruk. And this was a very, very nice little uh, fantasy story, and it was a really nice tale. Uh, it ended, I'm just going to give this out right now, no big spoilers, but it ends on a really, really big fuck you to the audience, and that was a big shock. Uh, I knew there was a sequel series out, but I didn't know that it was going to end like this. Uh, it pretty much ends in a way where if you got into the show, you're going to want or need to see like the ending or see the next season because it's just it's really engaging and the the ending leaves you on such a big cliffhanger. Uh, it doesn't answer many of the questions that you had, but you know that they've put all those answers into the second season. At least I hope they have. And now for the plot. It has been 80 years since King Gilgamesh of the Uruk Kingdom, located at the bottom of Juraga's tower, has climbed the tower and killed the demon god Juraga. The kingdom is currently celebrating the Summer of Anu, a celebration and for a god who weakens the power of all the monstrous, monstrous creatures within the tower. There are groups of people who climb the levels of the tower called climbers who are searching for glory, riches, or even the chance to find and defeat the new Draga, because Draga has been reincarnated. And when he was reincarnated, he added new sections onto the tower, so it got a much taller tower. The rumor is, if you can find and kill him, you will find this thing called the Blue Crystal Rod, which will grant one wish. One wish of anything. So pretty much, it's like a Medieval Times treasure hunt, to climb this tower and get this ultimate wish. Uh, people are looking for riches, people are looking for revenge, people are looking to bring people back from the dead. It's... it's a nice big, just treasure quest. There are a lot of characters in this show. A lot of characters in this show. They are separated pretty much into four main groups of people climbing this tower to go after uh, Juraga and defeat him. The first group follows Jill. He is a shield-wielding hero who has giant aspirations of becoming a great climber and a hero among climbers. He's teamed up with the priestess Kaya and her spear-wielding friend Ame. Along the way, they come across an older magician wizard guy named Melt, who's a very stuck-up but impoverished aristocrat. He used to be part of a wealthy family until he went broke. He has a little assistant named Koopa, who pretty much carries around his magic wands and everything for him as if she was the caddy at a golf course. The second group follows Neba, Jill's older brother who you can tell has a lot of secrets, especially from the fact that he's being constantly followed and pestered by a ghost. His team consists of the rogue Kali, the mage Fatina, and the big old giant armored guy Uru. There's also the king's army, who is led by two commanders. I'm pretty sure their names are Kelb and Ithana. Their goal is that they're taking the king's army up to defeat Druaga. And then there's the fourth group, which doesn't get a lot of screen time, but every time it does, you know something bad is going to happen because they are pretty much the constant antagonist throughout the climb. They are led by a creepy looking guy named Pazuz, very similar to Pazuzu for you Exorcist fans out there, and his group of no-name henchies who are all carrying giant coffins. The main story revolves around Jill and his group because they are the main focus. The first episode shows incompetence in Jill and the main story is Jill's progression into becoming this heroic figure that he wants to be. Throughout the show you do come across characters that you really enjoy and you do get to learn more about each character uh, as time goes on. And so you get further engrossed into what their deal is and what they're climbing the tower for. It's especially good when you find out that the rod they're all searching for only grants one person's wish, which makes it so everyone's starting to question just what they're climbing the tower for and what they want if they should succeed. The animation side of things was alright. It's a really cool style, I like it. The eyes aren't as big, so it makes the people look actually a bit more like people than uh, most, typical, most typical anime nowadays. The action scenes are really, really, really well animated and really cool, and they do a lot of really cool stunts with them, especially since they got some really original ideas going into with these uh, characters. 
For instance, Ame, the spear-wielding girl who's with Kaya, she, her, she doesn't just use a spear. Her spear is also a drill. It's got a like zip pulley thing, like when you're starting up a lawnmower, and she'll stab something and then pull the cable, and it'll just drill whatever it's stuck into, and that's really cool. And then you have the two different types of mages that I've seen in this. There's the first type that you see, which is in Neba's group named Fatina. She's a Sundari, it's weird. But she uses this really big, like, gun. This really huge, Halo-esque assault rifle type gun. And whenever she's using it, it uses fire magic. And so every time she points it, a bunch of, like, red flaming cards will come in a circle around her and they'll start spinning, and every time a card goes out in front of the gun, it'll shoot out a giant burst of fire. That's a really cool type of wizard. The second type, I think, is actually even better because of how original it seemed, and that's, of course, Mel, the older mage in uh, Jill's group with his assistant, Koopa. The way it works is very similar to how it works on a golf course where you have the person carrying the person's golf clubs, and he's like, um, I need this one, and they'll hand that one to them, and then they'll go. But instead of golf clubs, it's like wands, like uh, little staves and all that, each of them having different magical properties. So it goes a little something like this. Koopa, there's a dragon! Give me the number nine! Number nine, coming right up! Thanks, Koopa! And then whatever kind of magic he's casting will shoot out as if it's a golf ball. And that's really, really cool to watch. I'm always excited to see when the mage is going to kick into battle, because he is a stuck-up guy, so he's not going to be in every fight. Uh, he's not going to fight unless he's like, I guess it's not like you guys, it's like you guys just need me all the time, obviously. I might as well go in and help you. But yes, the animation is always really cool during the fight scenes. You have sword wielders and you have these magic users. Uh, you have Neba, who is a very powerful and very skilled archer, and they do some really cool stuff with that, too. The soundtrack wasn't really anything memorable to say. What I did notice seemed to fit the situations, though, and it did seem to stay in this. Uh, medieval epic story type music. It didn't go into like hip-hop or jazz or pop or anything. I will say that I did notice the music a lot during the fight with Druaga, the demon lord at the top of the tower, because uh, this really cool music kicks in during the second assault against him. So overall, this was a really enjoyable little show. It took, just took me a while to get around to watching it all, and I can see myself watching it with a bunch of my friends who used to play D&D with me and everything. It seems like something they would like too, because it does feel a very much like you're watching someone's D&D &D campaign unfold before your eyes, and that's a really cool feeling for me at least, because I play D&D. &D. The downsides are that the animation does get a little stale, the original soundtrack is not that, not as interesting as it could have been, and the fact that sometimes the characters' voice actors seem to be giving a lot more emotion than the characters' faces are, which doesn't seem to fit from time to time, especially near the end of the show. But on an overall scale of whether or not I would recommend this show to anybody, uh, yes, I actually would. I would recommend this show. It's a very nice little adventure. You can even show it to people who don't usually watch anime, and if they're into stuff like Lord of the Rings or anything, uh, you might even get them into it. My favorite character in the series, from what I could tell about this first season, is probably Koopa. She's really funny. She's really adorable and funny. It's primarily because they paired her with Melt, who is such a spoiled person. He's been living the rich life up until probably, I guess, a month before the story takes place. And she knows that he's a spoiled brat. She knows it, but she knows that he will die if she is not there, because he is constantly getting mixed up, like, in which which magical rods he needs and whatnot. He'll, like, say, I need number five, and she's like, no, you need a number three. And she'll hand him number three. Pretty much he'd be dead within, like, episode three if she wasn't there. And she's always got a little sarcastic side to her, which I can always I can always enjoy. Not to mention the fact that she is obviously the youngest person climbing this tower, and she holds her own pretty well. There's even an episode where she doesn't have the others with her, and she pretty much manages manages to survive. So that's all I got for the Tower of Draga, the Aegis or Aegis of Uruk. I will be checking out the second season eventually not not now because I do have some other shows I want to finish like Fruits Basket but I will be checking out the second season which is called The Sword of Rook. Of course I'll be putting the link to Crunchyroll where you can watch this show for free in the description. Uh, just be careful about the first episode it's very much a trap. It starts off really really goofy cartoony a uh, little questionable edgy moments but it does end leading into the main story which 
I could see causing problems for some people. And only because that first episode was really, really funny. So yeah, that's all this week. Uh, see you guys next time when I'll hopefully finish up Fruits Basket. Peace out.